enjoyed my introduction. Um, I live on the far south coast in New South Wales and, um, and I love spare fishing. Um, first of all I'd like to say thank you very much to Dr Rosetta Romano um, and to the great faculty at UC for inviting me to speak today and my apologies I can't make it in person um, but uh, Hopefully you'll find this um, useful from the student perspective and it may with luck even provide you with a bit of direction on future opportunities that you might like to explore and, and take a bit further. It's always a pleasure to get in front of UC students and in the past I've had the pleasure of sponsoring um, capstone projects at the University of Canberra. My name is uh, Marcus Jowsey and um, I'm a, an amateur um, environmentalist and, um, and professionally I'm a semantic information architect um, working on projects for governments and for industry. For around um, 20 years now I've been looking at um, at the impact of trade with regard to uh, what impact that has on ecology and what are the trade mechanisms that enable um, good both uh, environmental, social and governance practices and um, and what, what type of um, trade arrangements actually uh, have negative impacts on uh, ESG outcomes. And um, in particular, I've, I've looked at um, insets, something called trade insets um, versus offset trading and uh, consumer power. And how all that works in the context of transparency. And when I say transparency, I mean the ability to actually validate claims made about products that are traded in, in cross-border trade scenarios and validating those claims or repudiating those claims such that uh, manufacturers that, that use products that are imported across borders and consumers that consume the products are able to have a view of what is really going on behind these products in ESG terms. Offset trading, um, so we can think in terms of 
carbon trading or biodiversity trading. Uh, it's a mechanism that allows somebody who is, for instance, a carbon polluter to purchase credits and offset the pollution that their process or product results, um, the, the contribution of that pollution to climate change, of course. And insect trading penalises or rewards the pollution, uh, negative uh, ESG impacts, without attempting to offset those impacts. So let me give you an example. If I was uh, one of the EU block of countries and I was importing, let's say, clothing or, or fibre materials, that I would want my uh, constituency wants to spend their money on products that do least harm to the environment. And all of the manufacturers, all of the, the supply chains that I can import from, all make claims about how clean their product is. But if there was a mechanism to validate those claims, then uh, I can let the consumer decide which products they want to buy. And of course, consumers are, are always price constrained, that they, they are required to the extent of their wealth to select the most inexpensive products available to them. In this case, and I want to promote good environmental, social and governance outcomes associated with this supply chain product that's coming in across the border, I might choose to penalise by way of tariffs or sanctions, um, a product that didn't meet minimum standards with regard to the ESG outcomes. And in that way, I would make the dirtier product more expensive and allow the cleaner product a better price competition against the dirty product. Because what we find is that um, it's cheaper to produce a product where we don't try and maintain minimum standards with regard to environment, society and governance outcomes associated with that product supply chain and delivery to me across the border or to, to my constituents across the border. As a result, there has been a movement in the United Nations that has been very much driven by the European Economic Community to put in place a um, transparency mechanism that allows the, for any given uh, supply chain bringing products across the border to report in terms of the claims they make about the product, the evidence to support those claims, and being able to show that, in fact, what is said about this product is not false and not misleading, such that the various trade authorities can reward that by allowing an open trade scenario or punish the dirtier products through price mechanism, basically through leveraging tariffs to uh, make the product less competitive and make the cleaner products more competitive. So that's kind of the rundown of what the um, United Nations Transparency Protocol is trying to achieve. And it's now going into legislation in Brussels in the EU. Um, and that is based on something, and you can look it up, um, Recommendation 49 for Transparency at Scale. And we'll have a, a bit of a touch on that today. So let us start with a little bit of detail about the United Nations Transparency Protocol 
And you'll get as I move along how this relates to information interoperability at scale. So first, let's let's take a look at a supply chain. And what we have on screen is an example of a supply chain. And note the complexity in the arrows that are joining things together. You know, there's there's a lot going on in this space. Um, we've got uh, authorities, we've got lithium mines, processing plant, battery maker, car manufacturer, consumer, and a recycler, um, all associated with cross-border trade. And uh, you'll note also that there are, there are conceptual movements in this chain. We've got consumer choice, we've got government to business assessment, we've got business to business due diligence, um, and we've got, you know, the product flows that occur and uh, the movement of those products all covered off in this architecture. As we consider supply chains, uh, let me give you an overview of the UNTP architecture. The architecture is a blueprint for all the components for the specification and how they work together. It defines design principles which underpin the UNTP and shows components working together from the perspective of a single actor and across the entire value chain. The UNTP is fundamentally a decentralized architecture with no central store of data. Note the um, pillars that drive the architecture here. Secure the data, find the data, the data itself, understanding the data, and the value of the data within the transparency protocol. And value is, is outlined here, and I advise you all to take a look at the UNTP website to understand a little bit more detail, but now I'll briefly run through the various components for you. As I mentioned earlier, at the heart of the digital product passport is verifiable credentials. The World Wide Web Consortium has defined a data model for verifiable credentials. A VC is a portable digital version of everyday credentials like education certificates, permits, licenses, registration, and so on. VCs are digitally assigned are digitally signed by issuing party and are tamper evident, privacy preserving, revocable and digitally verifiable. Um, they work really well in the context of a digital product passport and from uh, a business requirement for a perhaps UNTP application, remembering it's a distributed architecture, um, verifiable credential technology is one of the key tools in the UNTP anti-greenwashing toolbox. But there are many different technical implementation options which present an interoperability risk, namely that the credentials issued by one party will not be understandable or verifiable by another party. The UNTP will not design new technical standards as um, that is the role of technology standards bodies such as W3C and IETF, for instance. However, um, recommendations for the use in the narrowest practical sense of technical options for a given business requirement, the UTM P, it embraces interoperability. So in this diagram that we're looking at now is 
It includes an example of the Australian Agricultural Trade Passport um, implementation and um, there we're looking at it for a livestock passport in, um, in export scenarios and cross-border scenarios. So this slide is showing a bit of the um, detail um, around the wise questions of the UNTP and this slide is um, talking to the UN digital conformity credential. All of these slides you can view on the UNTP website and um, the digital conformity credential um, actually highlights a concept of trust anchors and trust anchors are accreditation agencies. So, for instance, let's say my business has um, ISO 27001 security um, accreditation, then um, the conformity credential would be issued by ISO in that event. Um, the concept of events, there is um, handling for events in the, in the protocol and um, in particular traceability events, what, has, what information is available regarding what has changed in a supply chain scenario. And again, this is outlined in the UNTP. And I don't want to spend too much time on how all of the protocol and trade applies in terms of circularity. Circularity is one, if you like, one ESG topic area that um, needs to be considered along with desertification, slavery, um, carbon emissions and all of the other components that make up um, tra uh, traceability and transparency at scale and in particular um, information interoperability at scale which is an even bigger picture than the UNTP itself but you know getting down into what does this mean on the ground when I look at circularity, and in particular when I look at the goals set out by the Bega Circular Valley Enterprise, um, which by the way is well funded and it's Australia's most well funded circularity project, uh, I look at what they're trying to do. And um, in this slide, we can see that um, it's unlocking value for the community and will propel our region forward by progressing ongoing agenda around sustainability, biodiversity, climate resilience, economic growth and social inclusion. And um, if you jump down to the bottom there, you can see that currently the Bigger Circular Valley is targeting agriculture, forestry, marine and aquaculture, indigenous local land councils, um, health and ageing, um, technology and education, tourism, culture and the arts, and um, supply chain and support services. So we can begin to see here how in a local geographically defined area, communities can, um, if you like, form their own borders when it comes to maintaining ESG and eventually, the, and sooner if I have my way, um, the UNTP will be embraced um, by the bigger circular valley. Okay, two minute deep dive, then we're done. Um, in helping out the Department of Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry, 
I was challenged with putting together a profile of legislation and legislative instruments that impact the export um, of Australian agricultural products in a UNTP context. Uh, so a part of this was actually modelling how you know, the fundamental structure of legislation and then being able to create profiles of legislation that would be a single URL, URL that can be linked to within a verifiable credential within a digital product passport. And in this regard, we, I built a, a taxonomy based on the structure of law, but quite flattened off so that it only gave us what we needed to link to in terms of resolution and I uh, had to look at supply chains in order to get that resolution right and look at um, the structure of Australian legislation and came found out that it was already basically there within the if you like the table of contents typical for a act of law or a legislative instrument and from there was able to build this taxonomy, which is, you know, a basic um, RDF or Resource Description Framework, SCOS representation, and SCOS is a simple knowledge um, model for information, and uh, lay out this type of hierarchy. And from there, we were able to mine the information from the Australian government with regard to legislation and legislative instruments, um, populate a DCAT catalogue and enable profile views of that catalogue as that applied to particular supply chains like packaged beef to Japan or um, live, live trade with the Middle East. You know? Thanks a lot for your time today, people, and thank you for the opportunity, and thank you especially to Rosetta Bloomer and the UC faculty for inviting me. Thank you. Bye.